Turn with me now to the book of 1 John, chapter 2, once again. I mean what I say, though. I, God's real. I, I sure pray and hope that you know that God is more than just a figure upon the pages of an old book. I certainly hope that He's more to you than just some mental knowledge of something you've been taught all your life. I hope that hell's moved out of your heart and heaven's moved in by Christ in you, the hope of glory, and that you know by personal experience the assurance that is yours in Jesus Christ, God's only Son. We saw last week together how that John is written to these believers concerning the levels of spiritual growth and he's written to them concerning children and young men and fathers in the faith and we mentioned last week how that each and every one of these levels are essential. They're, they're needed in the Christian faith. Uh, we all must begin somewhere and we all must begin as infants. From there we grow and we want to grow in the knowledge of the Word of God and grow in our understanding of the Word so that we can fight the good fight of faith as these young men whom John has referred to in the previous verses, verses 12 through 14. But then there are those fathers in the faith who not only know the Word of God, but they know the God of the Word. And these fathers of the faith are that, is that level that we desire to attain to by God's grace as he continues to grow us and to stretch our minds and understandings. Well, now John writes yet again to these believers and he instructs them of a love that is wrong. He tells us that there is a love that God hates. And so let's begin by reading these verses together. Would you please stand with me one more time as we read 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world nor the things in the world if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Thank you. You may be seated. I can remember growing up, hearing a song on the radio that was written in the early 70s. The title to the song is, If Loving You Is Wrong, I Don't Want to Be Right. Please don't spend the rest of the time singing that song in your head, for those of you who are old enough to remember it. Why? Because the song is about an adulterous affair, told from the point of view of either the mistress or the cheating spouse, depending on the performer. Regardless, both parties involved express their desire to maintain the affair while at the same time acknowledging that the relationship is morally wrong. A song that was viewed by so many Americans as romantic was in reality repulsive in the eyes of God because of its adulterous content. The fact is this, there is a time when love is wrong, when love is sinful, and there is a love that God hates. The song begins with this line, If loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. If being right means being without you, I'd rather live a wrong life. The reason I read to you that line is because I believe that many in the church have that same philosophy about life. If being right means being without my sin. If being right means being without my lust, without my greed, without my fill-in-the-blank, I'd rather live a wrong life. However, what I want to urge you to do and what this text urges us to do this morning is to heed a command, to realize the corruption, and to see the conclusion that is given to us in this text this morning. That there is a love that God hates and there is a love that is wrong. And so let's look at that together. Number one, I want you to see the command in verse 15, the beginning of the verse. 
Verse 15 begins with this command, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. This command is as straightforward as you can get it. Just as clearly as God has commanded, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit murder. As clearly as God has commanded those commandments, God has commanded that we not love the world. Someone says, wait a minute. I thought the Bible says in John 3, 16 that God so loved the world. Why then are we commanded not to love the world when God so loved the world? Once again, we see the importance and the difference between the Greek language and English language and the importance of context. I've mentioned to you numerous times in the past how we use the word love, and for the same word, we use it for so many different reasons. We talk about loving ice cream, and we talk about loving our kids, and we understand that those things are not the same, yet we use the same word. The word world has different meanings in Scripture. For one, there is the Greek word cosmos, that is translated world. It refers to everything that God has created, the earth and all of the splendor of the created order. And so we understand that John is certainly not instructing us not to enjoy, not to love what God has created and what God himself has called in Genesis chapter 1 verse 31, very good. Second, we see the term world used in Scripture to refer to the world of humanity. In other words, it refers to every nationality, every race, every creed, every tongue in the world. And and that is what is referred to in John 3, 16, that God so loved a world of sinners that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever among that world of sinners might believe in him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so just as God loves a world of sinners, we too are called to love the sinner. We are to hate the drunkenness, but love the drunkard. We are to hate the drugs, but love the drug addict. We are to hate the sin, but love the sinner. Someone has asked me in the past, what would you do? If a homosexual walked in in the middle of your service and sat down on the front row, dressed in drag, my answer, preach the gospel and love them in Christ. Do I endorse homosexuality? Do I endorse that which God has called an abomination? Absolutely not. But for the grace of God, there go I and my sin... My sins of my youth of lusting for a woman are just as repulsive in the eyes of God as that individual lusting after their same sex. My point is simply this. We are all sinners and deserving of God's wrath and God's fiery judgment. But because of God's grace, there is hope, there is forgiveness, there is salvation. And so we hate the sin, but we love the sinner. Lastly, we see world used in Scripture to refer to the world system. It's what Paul referred to when he reminded the Ephesians that they formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. That's what John is referring to here in our text this morning when he says, do not love the world. He's not saying don't love sinners. He's not saying don't love and appreciate and give thanks to God for the beautiful mountains and the beautiful sea and ocean and all that God has created to be enjoyed that reflects his glory and shows his his handiwork. But he is instructing us not to love the world system. John further describes this in chapter 5 in verse 19 when he says, The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. In other words, this world system is Satan's system. 
It is Satan's system for opposing the work of Christ in the world. It's all that is in the world that opposes God and the ways of God. It is what you see on national news as government tries to remove God out of everything. It's what you see as people, no matter whether they believe in a God or not, push aside his commands, push aside his word, push aside what he has said is right and what he has said is wrong, to live to do what is right in their own eyes. The world system. And so John writes, do not love the world. Don't set your affections on this world system and don't live for it. Even though the world system says, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right, don't follow the world system and get sucked into its lies. Well, preacher, I understand I've got a wife and kids at home, but, you know, God just knew that, that my wife wasn't right for me, and that's why he put this mistress in my life to, to fulfill me and make me happy. You're smoking something. Or just dumb. Uh, God neither tempts us with sin, neither is he tempted. Therefore do not say when you're tempted, God has tempted me thus. That is adultery. That's what the world system says. The world system says just do it, and if it makes you happy, go for it. It doesn't matter if you abandon your wife of 20 years and your kids at home because all of a sudden you decide you want to come out of the closet and, and live a homosexual lifestyle. If that's what makes you happy, then do it and, 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 and forget those who are full of hate and who judge you for that. That's the world system. It ignores the Word of God. It, it ignores the standard of right and wrong that God has set before us. And, and not only does he say, do not love the world, he says, nor the things of the world. And we all understand what this means. More than likely, there, are, there is a higher percentage of those here this morning who struggle with being consumed with possessions than being tempted to abandon their family for an alternative lifestyle. But the command is just as strong. Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. This means that our lives are not to be devoted to houses or cars or clothes or jewelry or, or anything of this world. We can own them, we can enjoy them, we can appreciate them, but we are just not to love them and live for them. It's been well summarized this way. We can have things, but things just cannot have us. You know what I mean. When we're never satisfied and there always needs to be the next remodel and the next addition or the next upgrade or the next newest car or the next newest clothes or the next pair of shoes. And, and I'm talking about when you're consumed with those things and, and it's just you've, you've got to have it. You know what Jesus said? Jesus so long ago completely refuted what, I've, what I have personally seen on the bumpers of cars in our modern day era. The bumper sticker reads thus, He who dies with the most toys wins. This is what Jesus said. Luke 12, 15, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. So he who dies with the most toys doesn't win. Because Jesus said that our life does not consist of the possessions that we have. It's not about things. Do you know I have been 
in foreign countries where people literally got their water out of 55-gallon drums, where rain had poured into them or went down to dirty rivers and drew their water out of that river and drank it and who either had no clothes or one pair of clothes that they wore every day till they rotted off of them. And those people were, people were happier, honest to God. The Lord knows it to be true. With my own eyes, they were the happiest people I've ever been around, happier than the majority of Americans I've ever seen. And yet we have so much. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. What does that mean? Well, it means kind of the same thing as what you think of whenever you put a boat in water, doesn't it? The boat's to be in the water, but not of the water. Uh, you don't want it to be of the water and under the water and water all around and consumed by the water. You, you just want it to be in the water so that you can navigate where you need to go. And so it is with Christians that we are to be in the world. We, we brush shoulders with sinners. We, we are in the world, but we are to, to live in such a way that we do not become spotted by the world, as James says, pure and undefiled religion is. But we are to live in a way so that while we navigate in the world, people might see the hope of Jesus in us, not only in what we say, but in how we live. But we are not to be of the world. The boat's to be in the water, but the water's not to be in the boat. This is the commandment. In short, we are to love God and the things of God and the ways of God, not the world and the things of the world and the ways of the world. And why is this the case? This is the case because of what we see in the last part of verse 15 and what we see in verse 16 as well, which is the corruption. Would you look at that with me as well? In the latter part of verse 15 through verse 16, we see the reason that we're not to love the world nor the things of the world. Verse 15 says, if anyone loves the world, and what that means is, is if anyone gives the world first place in their life, that's what they're consumed with, that's what they live for, then the love of the Father is not in them. The love for the world demonstrates that the love of the Father is not in that person. The love for the world is a corrupt love that competes for the love of the Father. They are mutually exclusive from one another. And to the degree that you have one, you cannot have the other. Does that make sense? Do you see what he's, what he's saying here? It, it strikes fear into my, in my heart, in my mind when, when I hear people say, you know, I know I'm saved and I know that I, when I die I'm going to heaven and yet every bit of fruit in their life shows that they love the world, not God. Their priorities are prioritized with the world and self and everything but God. And, and that strikes fear in me. Listen, I can't make anyone be saved. I can't make anyone go to church. It's not my job to make anyone do any of those things. But it, it does bother me and it does grieve me and it does scare me. That we have so many people who are deceived. Who because they said a prayer, they walked an aisle, they joined the church, they have a mental belief in their head that they, they're going to heaven when they die. And yet time and time again, how many times have we come across passages like this in our preaching and studying through the Word of God that it comes up time and time again that if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. If you don't love the brethren... You don't know God. How many times in this book, how many times in Colossians, how many times in so many places have we not already seen that conclusion portrayed and communicated to us? Why? Because it is important that we be not deceived. It is important that you know the truth. And it's so frustrating sometimes. 
Because you just, you want to go and you want to you rip open that person's heart and, and force the truth in because you want them to get it. You want them to see it. And, and when you see them, just kind of roll their eyes and, and turn their head and tune you out. And, and you want to you wanna grab them and say, be saved, be saved. Because you understand, you and I understand that no matter whether that individual is a child or an adolescent or a young adult or a senior adult, they are but a heartbeat away from hell. They are one breath away from leaving this world. And wherever the tree falls, so shall it lie. When you leave this world, you leave this world how you will spend eternity, either lost or saved. Have all the clothes in the world. Have all the glamour in the world. Have all the possessions in the world. Have all the money in the world. And the rich man died and lifted his eyes in hell. The rich man died and lifted his eyes in hell. I want to be more stirred about this. I want us to be more stirred about this. Because when I read these passages that certainly are to speak to us and they are to equip us and they are to remind us that, John, John, you can't get consumed with stuff. And you've got to fight the good fight. And, and because God is in you, you've got to resist this world system and, and the lies and the stuff of this world that can distract you and, and pull you away from what's important. For if you live your life for things, what will you have when you stand before Christ at the judgment seat of Christ? That will be nothing but wood, hay, and stubble. Cars rust. Houses rot. Clothes decay. But there are those precious jewels and gems and things that are done for God that will glorify Him that we can carry on into eternity for where your treasure, where your, uh, where your treasure is, there your heart shall be also. Where is your heart this morning? Is it in stuff? Or is it in a Savior? Jesus said, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other, but you cannot serve God and wealth. The Bible gives us, a, gives us an example of a man doing just what I'm preaching about. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, Paul says, Demas, Demas having loved this present world, has deserted me. Left the faith turned his back on the work of God because Demas loved the world. James 4, 4, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. He then explains it even further in verse 16. Would you look at that with me? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. John gives us three things here that the world system uses to entice us, to entrap us, and to enslave us. They represent how the world operates. They are three descriptive categories of sin and three descriptive categories of all that is in the world and from the world. Do you see what they are? Number one, the lust of the flesh. This is sensuality. It's wanting to feel something. It's the strong desires and cravings of the flesh. The flesh that is in rebellion against God. And that flesh's desires and cravings for the things that are evil and sinful. That's what he says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are, look at this, immorality, impurity, sensuality. Lust of the flesh. Then he says the lust of the eyes. Not only is there sensuality, but here we see covetousness. Wanting to have something. It's being consumed with something that you do not have. The next man's wife over your wife. Trying to keep up with the Joneses. 
as the old cliche goes. They got a new car, we've got to get the next newest car. He got the newest iPhone, I want the next latest iPhone. Whatever the case may be, just the covetousness of, of having what you don't have. You know what Jesus said about that? In regard to the adultery side of it, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, You have heard that it is, it is uh, said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her, this is the lust of the eyes, it's covetousness, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And Jesus communicates the seriousness of this by the next sentence that he says, If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. That's how serious Jesus is. About not becoming consumed and enslaved and entrapped by the world system. The lust of the flesh, sensuality. The lust of the eyes, covetousness. The pride of life, simply pride. And, and John even calls it the boastful pride of life. This is wanting to be something. If the first thing was wanting to feel something, sensuality. The second thing is wanting to have something, covetousness. The third one is wanting to be something. It's, it's the appeal of being over others by position, possessions, power, or prestige. I'm better than you. I'm the CEO. You're just a janitor. Pride. I'm better than you. I'm more popular than you are in school. Nobody knows who you are. You're just a little locker flower over on the side, but everybody wants to be with me. Pride. And on and on we could go with different illustrations and way of describing these things. And, and this is of the world. He even says in our text, this is not from the Father. These are the destructive devices of the devil that are used to defile and destroy us. Such sensuality, covetousness, and pride is not from the Father. It is from the world because Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He desires to sift you as wheat. He seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. And what we must do as children of God is we must draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to us, resist the devil, and he must flee. Third and finally, very quickly, I want you to see verse 17, the conclusion. So what is the conclusion to what John has said? Here it is. The beginning of verse 17 says the world is passing away and also it's lust. What John says is if you get consumed and drawn into this world system, you need to know something. It's already dying. It's already devolving. It's already disintegrating, only to be destroyed by God completely when Jesus returns. It's on a one-way path to the fiery judgments of God. Is that really the boat you want to be on? For you see, to devote oneself to this world is to commit oneself to a sinking ship. I heard one preacher put it this way. He said, for you to remain in this world system and to treat, keep trying to climb up the ladder of success in this world, so to speak, is like trying to get an upgrade on the Titanic. But what does it really mean? What does it really matter if you, if you move from a standard room to a luxury room when the ship is sinking? And so it is with this. That's why we're reminded in Scripture that life is but a vapor. It's here and gone. That tomorrow's guaranteed to no one. That all we have is today. Why? Because we can so easily live as though we have forever. But we don't have forever. We have one short brief life. And so John says the world's passing away. And also it's lust. But notice this. But in contrast, the one who does the will of God lives forever. The one who loves God and does the will of God has nothing to fear concerning the construction, the destruction of this world system because that person will live forever, Jesus said. And John says right here, they have eternal life. 
This is why we must do what Paul says in Philippians 3, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And the way we must do this is while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, because the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 2 Corinthians 4.18 Do you hear what that's saying? Do you pick up on what these verses string, to, uh, string together mean for us? Let me just close with this. Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, my brethren, you brothers and sisters in Christ, I beseech you, I beg you, to present your bodies a living sacrifice to God. To not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, withstand, resist the world system. Do not be conformed by the ways of the world and the system of the world, but be transformed from the inside out by the Word of God, by the renewing of your mind. And present your bodies a living sacrifice to God, which is your reasonable service. It's the reasonable thing to do after all that God has done and is doing for us. The bottom line is this. As followers of Christ, we have been called to love what God loves, to hate what God hates. This means our hearts and our desires must be aligned with God's heart and God's desires. And there is not one of us in here, myself included, who is not at times tempted to live and to love the things of this world and to become distracted by those things so that we begin to live as though we have forever, forgetting that we have but this brief moment in history to live for the glory of God and to be reminded that whatever we live for in this world, it's only temporary anyway. It won't last. But he who does the will of God lives forever. Let's pray.